Good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started, because just like you, I want to get out of here as soon as possible. So as soon as we start, we can uh, get out of here sooner. So what I'm going to do today is sort of continue on what Dr. Nichols started talking about with the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to sort of look at a few ways, a few tools in which we can analyze the Gospel. Um, Because a lot of you, um, how many here have read the Gospel of Mark before Core 4? Okay, so quite a few of you have read the Gospel of Mark. And I'm assuming a lot of you who have read it, you probably just skimmed it when you came to Core 4. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take you out of that context of thinking, well, I know exactly what's in the Gospel. I, I can just look at the gospel and see what's going on there and sort of give you a whole variety of different tools to look at this gospel and look at it in a new, uh, a new way that you've got. And so these are the goals of the lecture that I've got for today. Um, the first one is to just introduce you to what is uh, a gospel. Um, and it's a completely different type of literary genre And so we wanted to look at what it is um, compared to, you know, say, a narrative or compared to, say, a a piece of poetry. Um, We wanted to look to see what actually a gospel is. And then some other things there, this is the bag of tools I was talking about, using different types of criticism to look at the biblical text and sort of encounter that text in a new way. And in particular, we're going to sort of do a practical example of that. We're going to look using narrative criticism at one of the themes within the gospel, and that is the theme of discipleship. And then after we sort of look at that theme, we'll use some of the other types of criticism. Um, We'll use historical criticism and textual criticism to look at um, what we're doing and sort of look at the context that this gospel was written in and sort of help us come out um, with a a theological perspective from this particular gospel. So the first thing, the gospel motif. Um, A lot of us in our modern context, when we say gospel, um, what we're referring to is one of the first four books of the New Testament. Um, Well, that's not really an accurate description of what a gospel is. A gospel literally just means good news. And so when uh, Paul's referring to his gospels and um, when a lot of the early church refers to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in fact, even when in the beginning of Mark it refers to that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's talking about a proclamation, something that is spoken. And in fact, in a lot of um, modern contexts as well, at least in the reform context from which I'm from, um, when we speak of gospel, we don't speak of any sort of written text, but we speak of what is proclaimed, you know, basically what the the preacher is preaching. Um, And that is the gospel that is being preached. And so also when Paul is referring to the gospel, when we start reading Paul's letters, um, he refers quite frequently to the gospel of Christ that he preached. Um, He's not referring to any of the four gospels that we're familiar with. Um, For one, they weren't written yet, and so he really couldn't refer to them. And so um, the gospels that we're um, dealing with, they weren't written until well after Paul had stopped writing his letters. Um, And so we can see that our canonical gospels, the four gospels that we have, they're not really referenced by the early church until late in the second century. Um, and so they weren't widely distributed until this, this early time in the second century. Another thing that we have in our biblical witness here is that we have four Gospels. And each one of those paints a different portrait. Uh, Dr. Nichols had a really good word analogy there. It paints a different portrait of the gospel of Jesus. And so when we look at these four gospels, we notice that they have vastly different theologies within them. They're speaking to different communities. And so they have a different order of events that happen in Christ's life. 
So we can see that um, some of the things are skewed and they're not happening in exactly the um, same order. They're also happening in different locations. The most exemplar um, of that is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, in some of the Gospels, it's, it, it is a Sermon on the Mount. In some of the Gospels, it's a Sermon on a plain, and so it's not on a, a mountain. And so you have different locations for the same events that are occurring. Now, what's going on there is that each one of these Gospel writers is writing to a particular community with a particular need and a particular set of people that are in that community um, it, that they're, they're, they're intending to write to. So there's a particular type of person that they're writing for. And so, you know, if you think about it in just this past week, if you think about what people are going to be preaching here around in Rensselaer and Remington and Lafayette, they'll probably be talking about flooding. They'll talk, be talking about the different things that are affecting people's lives, people's living, people living in shelters. And so they're preaching from the same text, um, and other people, you know, in a different part of the country, they probably won't be talking about flooding at all. They'll be talking about a completely different thing, but they're all using the same um, readings. They're using the same uh, sets of biblical texts, but they're coming up with different stories that are interpreted from these, these events, these Gospels that, that we have. And so that's really what's going on with these, these four Gospels right here, is we're really just talking about these different communities that we've got. And so this picture right here, it's um, a piece of wood, and uh, it has symbols for each one of the, the gospel writers. Um, the, I think the bull is for Mark, the lion is for Matthew, and I'm not sure what the other two. I think the, um, the eagle there is for Luke, and then the other one, whatever that is, a person, is for John. I'm not sure. I, you'll have to ask your uh, professors that, and I'll have to do some research. I should have done that before. Um, but they had symbols for these different Gospels that you've got. Now, ways in which we can encounter these texts. So here's uh, the tools that we can use. And this is just a small subset of the tools that we can use. Um, we can use source criticism. And we did that back in Core 3 when we were talking about the Yahweh source, the priestly source, uh, the uh, Eloah source, the Deuteronomist source. We were using source criticism. You we were saying that this particular source had a particular slant to it. Um, redaction criticism. Redaction criticism, um, we didn't do much of that. And really all that is is trying to figure out how the different sources were put together, how they were redacted together into one uh, coherent whole. Uh, we've got form criticism. And with form criticism, really all that is is saying that when you look at a narrative in the Gospel or a narrative in um, the Old Testament, it's going to be different than when they're using poetry. And it's going to be different when you have a parable motif than you have, let's say, a miracle motif. And so the forms are different that you have in the different, uh, different texts text that you're dealing with. And so you would look at those in different ways. So I'm not going to go through all these here. Let's see the last, let's see the last four, last three that we're going to be using. Textual, historical, narrative, um, and literary is sort of a broad overarching um, version of the narrative criticism. With textual criticism, what you're doing is you're looking at the ancient manuscripts that we have. And um, if you do, if you do a little bit of research on some of the manuscripts for the uh, biblical texts that we have, you'll notice that there are huge, huge variations in these texts. I think um, when they first started doing textual criticism way back in the 1800s uh, and looking at these texts, when they were putting together all these manuscripts, they found somewhere in the, um, in the numbers of 40,000 different variations um, within the, the text. And as we discover more and more manuscripts, we discover more and more variations in the text that we're dealing with. And so what textual criticism does is try, it tries to find the original manuscript, the original text from all of the other texts coming together. Um, historical